Recorded live at IPW in San Antonio, Texas, this is Brand USA Talks Travel. IPW 2023 brings together travel professionals from more than 70 countries. We've brought the podcast to Texas so you can hear directly from the leaders in the travel industry. Now, here's your host, Mark Lapidus. You're the master of arts in contemporary history and politics. How did you end up as a journalist and an on-air presenter? I fell asleep in the pub one day and then I woke up. Um, no, I mean, the Masters was, it was sort of a thing because I spent three years doing an undergrad in television production and I felt like it was a bit of a waste of time, to tell you the truth, because something I found, and this isn't casting aspersions on the people that teach it, but most of the people that do teach it haven't succeeded in the industry and then they go back into teaching and you think, what are you learning from these people? I noticed the same thing when I was in school. Yeah, exactly. I felt like, not in an arrogant way, that I was wasting my brain a bit for three years, so I thought I'd do something to uh, challenge myself and I hadn't done history since I was 13 years old but I'd always been interested in it so I, I had enough of the degree to get into a master's and I chose that and it opened up a really interesting new world to me and I use it so regularly as an angle in my writing that it's just been so useful. If we had time I would test you on dates but we don't have time. So. <laughs> Go on throw one at me. My guest today is Matt Charlton. Matt is based in the UK, and he's a writer, performer, and broadcaster, or as they say, presenter, working on digital print and broadcast. Matt, your LinkedIn profile indicates that you're an expert in travel, modern history, film, television, and music, with bylines in The Times, Rolling Stone, NME. I'm not familiar with that one. Is that British? The NME is a bit of a legendary publication in the UK. Okay. It's a music paper that's been around. It was actually originally called the Accordion Express nice. in the late 40s, and it ran the first national chart in the UK. It was a big part of the punk movement, so the Sex Pistols. In I should know this. One of their lyrics was, I use the NME. Oh, I, I use remember that. I use yeah, anarchy. sure. Yeah, so there you go. That's the NME. Thank you for tying that together nicely for me. He also writes for The Guardian, The Face, and Radio Times, and many others. Uh-huh. Matt regularly appears on BBC Five. I'm a real Six Music fan, by the way, i got to say. I used to work for Six Music. Did you? Yeah. One of my favorite radio stations in the world. Anyway, I was saying that you were on BBC Five Live and Times Radio, and it says in your profile that you make a decent cup of tea. I do. It's very important as a writer, <laughs> especially as a British writer, to make a decent cup of tea. Well, if you're ever near Washington, D.C., we'll have you over because my wife loves a decent cup of tea. The secret is letting it steep for five minutes. Leaving the bag in for five minutes. That's the secret. I'm going to tell her. Please. When you write stories about U.S. destinations, Matt, what are your favorite stories to cover? Well, I think the obvious answer there is music and music history. I mean, what really fascinates me about most places that I go in the world, actually, the two things that really give a place its personality are the food and the music. And you can tell how a city, particularly a city, has grown because of the way that the music has impacted it and the way the food's impacted it. And they're two very nice things. So I was just in New Orleans shooting a video with the BBC last uh-huh. week. Right. And I hadn't been in New Orleans for 30 years. Mm. And what you said resonates because it was so different in terms of both food and music. Mm. And what I just saw last week, it blew my mind. Oh, completely. And you scratch that surface and, you know, you're taken to a jazz club or a blues club or a techno club. And you discover something else and you discover something else. I mean, one of my first commissions as a music writer and a travel writer, actually, combined, was about techno in Berlin on the 30th anniversary of the wall coming down. And I got introduced to all these people that were founding these underground clubs before the wall, these illegal underground clubs in East Berlin. And then these turned into places like Berghain and Trezor, these super clubs that everyone can't get into these days. And then you just go down this rabbit hole of meeting someone else and someone else. And you get a real sense of character. And it's the same with especially U.S. cities. I mean, half of our music taste is built on U.S. music. Uh, The Beatles got all their taste from U.S. music. And you go to all these places and you see all these things that they've referenced and talked about. And you have a new perspective on it when you listen to it next. I should know this because I do listen to, to six music, as I said before. But what do you think the percentage of of American music is on radio today in the UK? Is it like as much as half or 60% or? I would say half. Um, it's a brilliant thing. The only thing I still love about the UK Careful. is that we still punch way above our weight with culture. And yes, it's because we did make half the world speak English once upon a time. <laughs> but for such a small island, small rainy little island to have given the world Bowie and the Beatles and more recently Oasis and Blur and Arctic Monkeys and all these other things, 
things. It's a great thing. And yes, um, we've got, I would say, 50-50 as a good ratio. Because you work freelance for so many publications in the UK, walk me through your pitch process for the various publications and how often are assignments given to you when they call you? Is it more you pitching or is it more them calling you or a combination? Or how does that work? It's usually me pitching. I mean, with the music journalism, just the pure music journalism mm-hmm. without the travel, that is sometimes given to me. For instance, I'm going to Boston after this and going to Boston Calling and it's the Foo Fighters' first gig since Taylor, their drummer, died. Their first proper gig after the tribute concert and I'm covering that for NME and they've said, you're there, could you do it for us? Um, so that sometimes falls in my lap a bit more but when it comes to travel writing, because it's quite a specific thing that I do I have to sort of go oh it's this anniversary can I do this Uh, because they're not really on top of that they're looking at just wider travel stories and road trips and all this sort of stuff so when you find yourself going to Boston to do something like that for music do Mm. you think oh well I'm there I might as well do a travel story on Boston oh completely it's the freelancer's philosophy just get as many commissions as you can while you're there so I have got two travel commissions while I'm there but also I write about television for the likes of Radio Times and, and me as well. I had a TV column in the NME for a while. And Frasier is coming back. It is? Frasier is being rebooted and he's moving back to Boston this time where everybody knows your name, obviously. So I'm going to do a couple of pieces about Frasier moving back to Boston, what he should expect when he moves back and what's changed since he moved away. So are you covering US travel stories on radio or television as well as in print? Uh, Not so much. I've gone on uh, BBC News a couple of times to talk about it, but no, I don't cover it as a sort of feature. But you could, right? I could, and I I will, one day. Because I don't think we get enough of that about the United States in media, outside of publications, right? We concentrate a lot on the written word, but there's so much we could do more in European media. Definitely. I think there's a general lack of travel shows on UK TV in particular, mostly sort of property shows abroad and stuff like that. There's not much that gets under the skin. We've got a great series called Travel Man, which is a sort of comedy travel series where someone that doesn't really want to travel spends long weekends in various locations. They've come to the US a couple of times with that. The only other one I can think of offhand is Somebody Feed Phil, which is you guys, which is Phil Rosenthal from Everybody Loves Raymond, is that what it's called? Um, Doing those things. And they're the only two travel shows that are around at the moment that really have a contemporary feel about them. I think we could do with more. I did tell Matt before he turned his microphone on about Go USA TV. TV, so you're gonna have to watch that when you get oh, back I to will. the UK. I will. You delivered some really sad news to me just a few minutes ago mm. about the passing of Tina Turner. I hadn't heard because I've been in this podcast booth all day, and I'm sure by the time our audience hears this news will be old for them. But it's fresh in your mind right now as you're sitting here talking to me. I'd like to hear how you covered it already for the media in the UK because here you are in the US. Is that why they called you? Because you're here? Or? Uh, no, I'm the guy now, unfortunately, that gets called whenever a musician dies, and it's. Been happening a lot recently, not least because the upper echelons of the boomers are getting towards that unfortunate time. Don't remind me. I know, I know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> but yeah, I, I seem to be appearing on BBC News and BBC Radio and Times Radio a lot recently talking about someone that's died, which is not what I got into this for. But at the same time, yeah, you get better known in the UK every time you do it, and that also helps your travel writing and your travel presentation. Right? Yeah, and I mean, you feel bad for thinking that way. That's the thing. Yeah, it's just the reality of life. It's how it works. It is, absolutely. It's sort of the last taboo that everyone's all heading the same direction. I'm lifting everyone's mood up on this podcast right now. But yes, to go back to what's been happening this afternoon in particular, I just had lunch. I walked out the restaurant and my phone went and I hadn't heard the news and the producer of Times Radio broke it to me and it was quite a rug pull. Tina Turner just seems to be one of those fixtures, mm-hmm. you know, one of those bastions of rock and roll that's she always was. been there and always will be there. And you think, okay, because rock and roll's forever young by its very nature. And so I had half an hour to A, find somewhere quiet and B, get some sort. They wanted the feel of, because I was out here, they wanted the feel of the reaction in Texas. But I thought I'd go to the Tennessee booth straight away. And they were being very careful about it because PRs are very careful about of it. Of course. They gave me one sentence. Did they know you were at a travel show? I mentioned on air that I was a travel show. No, I just mentioned I was in Texas for work. So I don't know what they thought I was wow. doing here. Wow. But I, yeah, I ran over to the Tennessee travel booth and they gave me one sentence 
instance, like we appreciate her contribution to music. I mean, they can't really say much else unless they put their foot in it somehow. I understand that. I was able to say that on air, which gave a nice flavour. But yes, I had 10 minutes to put that together, read through all the immediate obituaries that had come out, because obviously with someone her age, and we know she's been ill for a little while, they have been prepared. I read The Guardian, I read The Times, I read all the things that were popping up, BBC. And then I went live on air, and then I did that spot, and then I got another call. I did that spot. I did. So it's been pretty intense, and I'm probably talking much faster than I normally would because the <laughs> adrenaline's pumping through me. Tell me about your coverage of food in the United States, because I know there's something else you like to do. Like I said with music, it's just a way of getting to the root of a city and to the story of a city from all the immigration. You can see all the layers of the story. It's like uh, cutting into the ground and seeing all the layers of constructions and where it's all come from. And it doesn't just give you that. It gives you the sense of a soul of a place, and it introduces you to people who care a lot about their neighbourhood and their city. Without going making a horrible pun, it gives you a real taste of the place. You're probably going to find this interesting. Before the pandemic, Pandemic, our research was telling us that while tourists were interested in food, it wasn't a significant driver of tourism to the United States. Like people would eat when they traveled, but they weren't traveling to eat. Mm. But since recovery began, that's flipped on its head. Now, I suspect people were just sick of eating their own food at home. There and maybe that. that just changed everyone's taste, literally. That has changed dramatically. It seems like a lot of tourists now are interested in actually booking trips to the United States based on their culinary desires. Well, I think a big lot lockdown hit because we couldn't travel was somebody feed Phil I mean it was on Netflix and everyone travelled vicariously through, through his series 100%. and obviously the whole point of that show is that he goes and eats and I don't know how that man is so thin it's ridiculous <laughs> it's the magic of television the magic now. of television the magic of money from everybody loves Raymond I think I don't know what goes on there but yeah everyone just lived vicariously through that and then they saw the pleasure that you can get from finding these little hole in the wall places that you just would otherwise walk past and not going to the main strip and just finding the family things and getting a real sense of the place from that and not just going into the local bubba gump shrimp you know in the evening how do you find food stories specific to the united states i quite like to have some sort of talisman so if the tourist board work with a particular chef that can show me around that can introduce me to the place but maybe introduce me to the places that they ate as well as a kid or the places the diner they worked in as a kid and where they learned their craft and yeah the grand place is lovely with the tasting menus and the wine pairings and all that that's lovely but as I said the hole in wall places the diners the kitchens even that's what gives you a real sense of the place and if you've got a real person showing you that as opposed to an itinerary that makes for such a better article too tell me about a few that you really enjoyed writing the big revelation actually is San Antonio they've obviously been delighted to have us here and you can tell you can tell the love that's been put into this the fact they just really want to show off their food scene and as you were saying, the big swing towards food tourism is very much indicated in what they've been pushing us towards here and what you can learn through Tex-Mex and the authentic Mexican flavors that have come in. And I didn't know much about San Antonio before I came here. You know about Dallas. I mean, you know about Nashville and Austin and all this, all these southern places. But yeah, San Antonio was uh, not on my radar. And I've learned a lot through the culinary experiences that have been sort of well, pushed onto us here, but in the best way possible. How did Destinations Best Pitch? you stories anniversaries of music and TV are great travel angles for me especially Radio Times which I work for quite a lot it's for people that don't know it it's a TV listings magazine but it's quite high end and it's got a very well off and older demographic who have the money to spend uh, music tourism is a big thing especially with all these anniversaries coming up I might even you know talking about Tina Turner I might even head down to Tennessee now to sort of search out her legacy and see what she brought to the city and I mean that's again quite a morbid way of thinking about it but it's an angle you know that is an Certainly. angle but you're always looking for like when is Motown's 70th you know when did Bowie go to LA um, Daisy Jones and the Six has just been out which is very indicative of the sapia tinted sunset strip with the troubadour and the viper rooms and you, you know Memphis and Elvis and all this sort of stuff so you're always looking for a hook and an anniversary like the Elvis movie was last year and that's always a really strong angle 
How about food angles? Oh, food angles. Well, it is about finding that talisman. We've got uh, Sean Brock, I think his name is, who is a chef down Nashville way. And I was introduced to him and he was telling me about the Appalachian food and he's grown up with that. It's in his heart. And again, as I said before, he takes you not only to the high-end restaurants that he runs, but all the places that he likes to eat, the diners. And I was introduced to collard greens, which I'd never heard of before and looked disgusting, but tastes amazing. <laughs> and cornbread and all this sort of stuff. And I mean, Nashville, it's music and food. So it's my perfect place. So that's a great... You ever thing. follow influencers around from the UK that are visiting the United States <laughs> just to write about it? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, there's a new angle for you. Yeah, yeah. Just follow an influencer around and see how they live, like a wildlife documentary. Well, I'll, I'll give you an example. So we work with a group called Sorted Food. I don't know if you've ever heard of them or not, but they have almost 3 million followers on YouTube and they make television shows for us for Go USA TV as well. These are four or five, depending on the season blokes, as you call them, mm -hmm. from London that grew up together. And they love to cook and they love to eat and they create different challenges for themselves in the United States. In fact, they're going to be coming to Texas this summer doing videos about doing things bigger in Texas, you know, searching for these meals and then trying to recreate them themselves while they're on the road. See. Yeah. So I'm thinking that once in a while, it doesn't have to be specific sort of food, but another angle for a travel writer like yourself are finding groups of guys like this that are already working with U.S. destinations mm. and then amplifying it in some way through your writing or through your media. It's a nice thought, finally uniting journalists and influencers right. over, over the great divide between right. us. Of course, because usually you're fighting or... You... Yeah, totally. I mean, when we're putting on a fam group together, it's such a different way of working. Sometimes we're not allowed to eat our food until they've taken photos of oh, it. Oh, come on. Oh, I was on the trip last year. I won't say where because <laughs> I'll get too specific, but the, my food got put in front of me and I got my knife and fork and they went, wait. And for about 10 minutes, they have their different iPhone lights in different directions trying to get the perfect picture and by which time my fries had gone cold <laughs> and I will never forgive them for that. How do you find your travel angles for television? Well, it's quite useful being a TV journalist because I've got the emails coming in from Netflix and the BBC and all this sort of stuff telling me such and such is now filming, certain studio announcing the cast for a new thing that's coming up and then usually Wikipedia saying filming and it says it took place from December to March in New Mexico, right. for example. And you go, oh, right, well, I can definitely go there because it was filmed there, but where's it set? Because so many places are used for other places. And the good example I can give you at the moment is Puerto Rico. I went to a post -fan last year and it was without a commission it's just because I happened to be here they were very nice and took me over there and we were on a tour and they were saying well because we're US dependency we double up for Cuba we double up for Brazil and because tax breaks and no visas for the cast and all this so this place was used in Rambo this place was used in, and this place is going to be used in Wakanda forever this waterfall here and I went oh okay so Wakanda forever's out in November and then I went back and I pitched Radio Times saying this is the hook this is the movie that's at the time Timely hook, and here's the rest of it. It's got loads of famous films set around. The Apocalypse Now, I believe, was filmed there for a little bit too, which would play right into the audience's taste. So as soon as you have that, that's a little light bulb goes on in your head, and you hear about a filming location, you go, oh, okay, that's good. That's that sounds like so much fun. I'm jealous. It's a lot of fun, and then you get to see some really cool places that you wouldn't normally go to. I've just come back from Australia, where a show called Ten Pound Poms was filmed, about the mass immigrants from the UK to Australia in the 1950s. But I was taken to these little towns that looked like they're still in the 1800s, these frontier towns that you'd never go to. And it's similar in the US. You get taken to all these sets in the deserts and all these places that you'd never normally go to just because some clever film scout found that location and gone, oh, that looks good on TV. Matt, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you. If somebody listening wants to get hold of you to take advantage of your work, how do they do that? I'm on Instagram, and that's Matt C, M-A-T-T-S-E-E, -E, or I'm on Twitter at Matt underscore Charlton. And that's Brand USA Talks Travel, live from San Antonio, Texas at IPW. I'm Mark Lapidus. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this live from IPW San Antonio, Texas episode, please share it with your friends in the travel industry. Safe travels.